When you look at educational attainment here in the UK, unfortunately, you tend to find that children of a black Caribbean background tend to be at or near the bottom of the attainment figures. In this video, I'm going to suggest to you that a large part of the reason for this is due to sabotage of the education of these black Caribbean children, they used to be called West Indian children, by the British state and by the educational system. Before we get right into the, the, the details, I want to just explain my own personal interest in this. I'm East African in origin, I'm from Uganda, but I am actually married into a Jamaican, a large Jamaican family here in the UK. And my two sons are thus half Jamaican. Some of my in-laws would have been directly affected by some of the things that we're gonna talk about in this video. As a child in the 1980s, being in the educational system at that time, some of my peers would have been affected by these kinds of things and had their futures damaged by these things that we're gonna discuss. And then of course, my two children are in the educational system right now. And so this is very close to home for me. This is a very personal topic for me. It's not just an academic topic for me. But let's get straight into it. And there's there's really only one place to, to start when it comes to talking about this whole topic, and that is the ESN scandal. So ESN stands for Educationally Subnormal. And this was a label that, that was put on children to indicate that in the opinion of those who were making the, the putting on the labels and thus had the power to enforce those labels, certain children were intellectually disabled or, or intellectually or mentally unfit. Now the, the whole practice of labeling children as being mentally unfit really goes back to the start of the 20th century. In the early 1900s, the British state gave itself the right to label children as being you know, mentally retarded or mentally unfit, which is the kind of language they used to use back in those days. The state was able to, in some cases, remove those children from the care of their actual parents and their family in order for the state to directly raise those children. After the Second World War, the post war Labour government of Clement Attlee introduced ESN schools, educationally subnormal schools, in order to provide a level of education that was more in keeping with the supposed station of these children who had been labelled. This spread of ESN schools took place at exactly the same time as immigration from Britain's colonies in the West Indies and Africa and its former colonies in South Asia really started to ramp up. While a lot of these immigrants were adults, a lot of them were also children and a lot of them would have come from their home countries straight into the educational system here. And it's these children are the ones who have been affected by this so-called ESN scandal. What you find is that these children from South Asia and the Caribbean, the West Indies in Africa were disproportionately being labelled as being educationally subnormal. So for example, in London, by 1968, 30% of the children who were in these ESN schools were made up of immigrants, even though immigrants only made up 17% of the mainstream school population in London. Similarly, the Inner London Education Authority, so ILIA, this is a, this is a body that used to manage the education in, in about 10 inner city boroughs. In 1968, ILIA admitted that black children, West Indian children, were four times more likely to be wrongly placed in ESN schools in comparison to white children who were wrongly placed. Why was this the case? Why were West Indian, black Caribbean children being disproportionately labelled as being educationally subnormal? Well, first of all, there was absolutely a, a belief on the part of many within the educational system and the country as a whole that West Indians and by extension black people were generally speaking intellectually inferior to white people. This is, this is the racial science that goes back many centuries here in the Western world. And there are there are various statements from educational bodies and people, you know, teach head teachers and all these kinds of people, which said, yeah, they in their opinion, they felt that black children were just genetically, naturally inferior intellectually to other children. So and that played a part, as we're going to see, in some of the things that the education system was doing against West Indian children. Just so we're clear, the educational the education received in a lot of those schools couldn't really be called education. When you hear testimonies, for example, in the BBC documentary Subnormal, you hear the testimonies from these now grown up elders talking about what they experienced. They're, tell they're talking about how there was no real school, there was no real education, they were just left to play or do the most basic things. And so obviously that is going to stymie their 
future that they're not going to leave with any or many grades or any useful grades and then of course that's going to hinder their life their outcomes in life later on in response to what was being seen what are, what our children were experiencing back in the 60s and 70s in response to that the people came together and organized getting together organizing campaigning advocating for you know to the government and to the to the powers that be in this country about some of these concerns that they had one example really interesting example came in Haringey in North London Haringey Borough Council adopted the report to the Haringey Com Education Committee on Comprehensive Education on 31st of March 1969 proposing that a system of banding should be implemented across Haringey's comprehensive schools the official reasoning was to maximize the performance of students through streaming by academic ability however people were suspicious of the frequent emphasis placed upon the high proportion of immigrants within the borough a leaked document titled Haringey Comprehensive Schools January 1969 subsequently known in the community as the Dalton Report sparked widespread opposition because of the following text on a rough calculation about half the immigrants will be West Indians at seven of the 11 schools the significance of this being the general recognition that their IQs work out below their English contemporaries thus academic standards will be lower in schools where they form a large group when this report was leaked the black caribbean the west indian west indian community didn't just sit around and say no oh, this is not very good they organized they organized public meetings were held across london to encourage debate and organized demonstra demonstrations particular attention was paid to informing parents about what was happening to their children in schools sensing unease the council delayed the proposals on banding this gave the protesters the time they needed to circulate copies of the council reports draw up leaflets and prepare a response to the dalton report refuting every paragraph a high profile campaign with good access to the media resulted in the conservative council postponing its banding proposals before being defeated in the may 1970 elections in 19 1971 the Grenadian academic Bernard Cord who was at that time studying in the UK published his seminal book entitled how the West Indian child is made educationally subnormal in the British school system in 2005 Cord reminisced on the impact of his book stating that the black community's response to the book was incredible thousands of black parents in small groups throughout the country began meeting and several parents groups were formed Black supplementary schools were formed up and down the country. Some estimates put the number of these schools as many as 150. Black youth groups were formed and existing ones held regular discussions on the scandal and what their members could do to help. I found myself invited to come and address many of these groups and other organizations all over Britain. From May to September of 1971, I was addressing between three and five such groups every weekday afternoon and evening and on weekends. The level of concern and the sheer energy of the participants was something to behold. In addition to the extraordinary galvanizing effect that the book had within the black community, it is my belief that the turnaround in the establishment's response also owed a great deal to the support which the contents of the book, its main thrust and objectives, received from thousands of teachers, white teachers, including several head teachers up and down the country. Significant sections of mainstream in public opinion embraced the fact that what was happening was unfair indeed scandalous and should be acknowledged by those in charge and brought to an end dozens of journalists went out of their way too to get this message across a book which was written for and intended by the author only for black parents in the black community had taken on a life of its own mobilizing as never before the black community but also reaching touching and influencing white teachers student teachers university students journalists trade union leaders and other broadly progressive sections of the majority population. These ESN schools were eventually phased out in the 1980s, I believe, but the damage had already been done. You're talking about a decade and a half, two decades worth of systemic discrimination and labeling of black West Indian children in particular as being educationally subnormal. That meant that their educational outcomes were poor, poorer, many of them, their educational outcomes are poorer. Those who succeeded, big ups to them, they succeeded in spite of, not because of the educational system. And the impact of this obviously has, has continued to have an impact on black Caribbean people as they're now called to this to this very day whenever we're talking about anything to do with education we have to always keep in mind this ESN scandal and this the black education movement that that 
was formed in response to this as examples of one, the challenges and the, the obstacles which West Indian, Black Caribbean people in particular has faced since they came to this country in large numbers for the first time in the post-World War II era. Also equally, if not, if not probably more importantly, this whole ESN scandal shows us the power and the strength, as I said, of the West Indian community, of the Black Caribbean community here. It's determination to do whatever it would take for them to be able to withstand and to fight against and to end this open discrimination against them by the British state. I'd love to hear your comments on this, particularly if you or you know people in your sphere, your networks, your friends or your family have actually were actually affected directly by any of these things. I'd love to hear your insights into this and of course make sure that you are subscribed if you haven't already subscribed. Make sure you like the video if you haven't already liked the video. Hopefully you did that after 10 seconds because it was so good at the beginning. <laughs> And of course, as ever, there are other videos that will be useful and informative for you to watch. YouTube should suggest one here. And I think that this video here will dovetail very nicely as well with the topic that I've talked about today. All right, take good care. My name is Ellie Wananda and I will speak to you soon.